Mr. McCoy here with the ear, the eye, and the arm, part six. Hmm. Father stalked around ear, eye, and arm, looking them over. They wouldn't get into the army, he concluded. They have special abilities, Mother hastily explained what these were. Hmm, said Father. Only Mother could tell the difference between the two humphs. The second meant he was actively interested in the men and was considering using their services. You're hired, he said abruptly. Then he quickly produced pictures of the children, credit cards, maps of the city with phone numbers of the police stations, his own private number to be used day or night, and a great deal of advice. Almost before they knew it, ear, eye, and arm were handed their Nirvana guns and herded back to the limo. Use the bus for business, Father said. You'd scare witnesses away from the limo. Report to me six times a day. Good luck. He shook hands with each detective, but paused and raised his eyebrows when he touched arm. The limo took off. He turned back to Mother. It's bad news, I'm afraid. We traced them to the Chili Bite stall, where they were charged three times the going price. No one else remembers them. They're like babies out there. Why, why didn't I let them grow up? Father rubbed his eyes. He looked around sharply to be sure none of his officers saw him with his own guard down. They're probably all right, Mother said, but she was beginning to be affected by Amadeus' gloom. The sun was settling toward the west. Shadows grew along the garden. If the children didn't come soon... That arm has the funniest handshake said Father, watching the shadows creep across the grass. He's stronger than he looks, too. Tendai kept Kuda close to him as they were herded back to the person known as the She-Elephant. All around them, the mournful shapes of men and women rose from the ground or emerged from holes. Dead Man's Vlay wasn't empty at all. They're like moths, Tendai thought. They camouflaged themselves to fit their background wondered at their silence. They didn't laugh or talk. They didn't even make much noise as they shuffled across the ground. It's not surprising this place is called dead, he thought with a shudder. They came down to a large flat field surrounded by hills. In the middle was a cooking area with a fireplace and stew pots. There were a few trestle tables and four or five old chairs. An ancient woman sat in a rocking chair and sipped a mug of tea. Knife stood by her, his hand clamped on Rita's arm. Fist scowled at Tendai as he went by. Little rats, hissed the old woman as she rocked monotonously. Tendai, shouted Rita, tell these old squishy banana faces to let us go. She shook her arm, but Knife grimly held on. Tendai suddenly noticed the woman who was sitting in one of the armchairs. She was so large, he had thought she was an armchair. The woman stood up and planted her ham-like hands on her hips. So here are the other little squealers, she said in a deep, hearty voice. Bring them up and let's see if they're big enough to eat. Tendai and Kuda were urged forward by the silent, lay people. Don't you hurt my brother. He's only a baby, Tendai said. I am not, yelled Kuda. My father will lock you up for a thousand years, Rita screamed. The she-elephant roared with laughter. They're mosquitoes, brats, all right. Well, listen up, little squealers. This is my country. Your father comes snooping around, I'll run a train over him. You do what I say and we'll get along fine. Now get down that hole and change your clothes. She picked up Rita, who pounded vigorously on the big woman's back and disappeared down a burrow. Tendai and Kuda were carried down another by fist and knife. They were dumped on the floor of a gloomy chamber, shucked out of their clothes, and left a pile of rags to put on. Knife held the scout knife up to admire the dragons before shoving it into his belt. Tendai was trembling with shock and anger, but he tried to appear calm for Kuda's sake. Let me help you get dressed, he said. Ugh, these clothes are filthy. Kuda rummaged through the rags until he found a man's shirt with the sleeves torn off. Nice, he commented. He smiled as Tendai buttoned it and tied a rag around him for a belt. It's like one of the mellower stories, Tendai said, smiling back, but he instantly regretted mentioning the praise singer. 
I want the mellower, said Kuda with his face screwed up. I don't like these other people. This is like a story, remember? We'll have lots of adventures and then go home. We will go home, won't we? Of course. We're going to have fun. And I hoped his face didn't show how worried he was. Kuda seemed to accept his big brother's promise because he immediately began to explore the chamber. It was hollowed out of the ground with tunnels leading out on all sides. A single candle trembled in a slight breeze. The walls and floor were a mishmash of plastic bags, dirt, grass roots, and stones. Get up here, shouted Fist down the tunnel that led to the surface. Tendai helped Kuda up the steep slope. He felt inexpressibly dirty in the rags. They had a dank smell that reminded him of an old refrigerator. Rita was weeping on the ground by the she-elephant's chair. She wore a shapeless brown-gray dress with many patches. One side of her face was swollen and her hair and hands were caked with dirt. On the other hand, Rita had given nearly as good as she got. There were several deep scratches on the she-elephant's arms. Here, sell these in the cow's guts. The she-elephant tossed the children's good clothes to fist. She then washed Tendai's monkey bite with boiled water and applied disinfectant. Someone should give that beast a teething ring, she said, shaking her head. Sit down at the table, brats. You can eat something before you work. Tendai and Kuda climbed onto a bench at the side of a trestle table. Rita, still sniffling, sat across from them. The she-elephant busied herself at the cooking pots. From one filled with boiling water, she fished out three metal plates with a pair of tongs and clanged them onto the table. They steamed and dried in the afternoon sun. She plopped a ladle of salsa onto each plate and drenched it with sauce from a third pot. Tendai had planned to reject food the way heroes did in stories when they were captured by enemies, but the sauce smelled delicious. It was richly red with tomatoes, spicy with onions and garlic, and laced with enough chilies to make his nose prickle. It won't do any good to get weak, he thought. Besides, Kuda won't eat unless I do, and it isn't good for little children to starve. So Tendai, not seeing any spoons or forks, broke off a piece of salsa with his fingers and popped it into his mouth. Kuda immediately copied him. So when have you ever found yourself in a situation where you do something because you're setting a great example for someone else? Share your experience with your fellow listeners. It's good, said the little boy with his mouth full. More! The she-elephant filled his plate again when he was finished. Tendai found himself eating as though he hadn't had anything for days. The tomatoes were more tomatoey, the onions stronger, even the salt more salt-like, and mixed with them was a hint of smoke from the she-elephant's fire. Maybe it's because we're eating outdoors, thought Tendai. Whatever it was, he found himself holding out his plate like Kuda and asking for more. It was only when he finished the second helping that he looked up and saw that Rita hadn't touched her food. Go on, he whispered. It's delicious. I don't eat with my hands, sneered Rita, and I don't eat without washing my hands. I'm not an animal. We're not at home. Please, Rita, eat. You'll feel better. I don't lower my standards because I'm surrounded with riffraff. Riffraff, huh? said the she-elephant, hugely amused. You should see yourself in the mirror. I can't help what's on the outside, but inside I know what I'm worth. Not like some. Be quiet, Rita, Tendai whispered. He saw with a sinking heart where the argument was going. Rita was an incurable shooperer. A shooperer always said the one thing guaranteed to tip a friendly discussion into a quarrel. When everyone was tired of fighting and wanted to make peace, a shooperer said the one thing calculated to start the argument again. Rotten to the core, said Rita. You mean me, you little squealer, snarled the she-elephant. I wouldn't know, I can't see past all that blubber. The she-elephant snatched away Rita's plate and dumped the contents into the salt supply. You can eat rats for all I care, she roared. Now get off that bench. Around here, people work for a living. She plucked Rita from her seat and tucked her under one enormous arm. Tendai put his arm around Kuda. He didn't know what they were in for now. 
Suddenly, he noticed that the lay people had silently crept up to them while they were eating. They pressed in almost like a tide in the ground. Nice children, said one in a whispery voice. Poor babies, sighed the old woman, timidly reaching out her hand to touch Kuda. Back! Back! shouted the she-elephant as Kuda screamed. The afternoon shift isn't over. Get to work, or you'll get no dinner. Regretfully, the Vlay people moved away as silently as they had come. They melted into the landscape on either side. Soon the Vlay looked as deserted as a valley on the moon. The wind mournfully rippled the hills of garbage. The she-elephant hustled them down into a tunnel. Down, down they went, much farther than the chamber in which Tendai and Kuda had changed their clothes. The ground became muddy, and by the time the trail leveled out, they had to wade through water. The she-elephant put Rita down and switched on a flashlight. Go on, she said. Tendai hoisted Kuda to his back and followed. The tunnels branched and rebranched in a bewildering way. Water dripped from the ceiling, knotted grass roots hung down and brushed them as they passed. We don't use this area in the rainy season, said the she-elephant. You'll need fins to get around. Go up here, she indicated an upward tunnel with the flashlight. Tendai was relieved to find dry ground under his feet again. He put Kuda down, his legs still ached from the flight over the vlay. They came to a large round chamber. The she-elephant took three lamps from a shelf in the wall. Tendai was intrigued. He had seen ones like them in history books. They were called kerosene lamps. The woman pumped and adjusted the fuel gauge on one until it hissed. She lit it, taking care not to let the screen surrounding the fuel outlet on fire. It gave a surprisingly cheerful light. That's right, said the she-elephant when she noticed Tendai's interest. Learn how it works. You can help me set them up. She demonstrated the procedure with the next lamp, turned it off, and let Tendai do it himself. They run out of kerosene after a while. When that happens, let them cool, fill the fuel chamber, and turn on again. She indicated the fuel drum by the wall and a box of matches. Tendai felt very slightly that the she-elephant might not be as bad as she seemed, but her next action drove that idea out of his head. She led them down a tunnel that ended abruptly in a wall of trash. Get to work, she said, handing out picks and shovels. Put the extra dirt in a cart and pull it back to that chamber. Someone will get rid of it for you. You want us to dig? asked Tendai. Mine, stupid. This is a plastic mine. You pull out the trash and sift through it. Anything interesting, a bowl or a cup, put to one side. Old glassware is okay, too. Everything else goes on the cart. Oh, and don't get fancy with the digging. Holes can collapse. And be sure the lamp's burning brightly. If it starts to turn red, the air's going bad. She clamped a chain around Tendai's ankle and fastened it with a padlock. The chain was attached to a chunk of cement. Rita was fettered the same way. I don't think you can find your way out, but this will slow you down, especially in the deep water. We're not going to do anything, Rita said shrilly. Loaf if you like, the big woman shrugged. The workers trap rats when they don't satisfy me enough to get fed. Some of the grass roots are said to be tasty, I wouldn't know. The she-elephant lumbered back to the round chamber. Tendai tried to follow, but the cement block stopped him. He yanked on it. It moved forward a few inches. He sat down on the ground and tried to think. It's so dirty and horrible, cried Rita. How are we ever going to get away? Great question. How are they ever going to get away? What do you think? Share with your fellow listeners. Mama, whimpered Kuda. It's okay, this is a game, Tendai told his little brother. We'll never see mother or father again. We'll die down here with the rats and mud. Rita burst into tears. Kuda began to wail. Rita, shouted Tendai, shaking her. If they were going to hurt us, they would have done so already. This is a game. You're scaring Kuda. She hugged herself and rocked back and forth. Presently, her sobs died down to sniffles. You're right, I'm being stupid. It's a treasure hunt, Kuda. We're going to dig up toys from the ground. You can have a shovel all to yourself. Tendai folded the little boy's fingers around the handle. Kuda's eyes grew round. It's big. 
It's the same size as mine. Look, we'll start on that patch over there. Rita wiped her eyes. Maybe we'll find something valuable. I've always admired the plastic dishes people had in their living rooms. I never knew where they came from. That's the spirit. We're scouts after all. We're prepared for everything. We could get badges for this, said Rita. Of course, for geology and nature study. For exploring, Rita said bitterly. I'm sure even the scoutmaster doesn't know about this place. Tendai began working on a mass of ancient shopping bags. They disintegrated as he pulled them from the wall. He found pieces of old glass mottled with rainbow swirls and fragments of pottery. A strange feeling came over him. The ancestors had been here, and they might even be here now, watching him pull out the remnants of their lives. Did they mind? Here's an unbroken bottle, said Rita. It was a flask about three inches tall. The surface is lumpy, Tendai said, feeling the glass. He held it close to the lamp. It's writing. English. He searched his mind for the correct translation. His English was limited. Pink pills for pale people. Rita laughed. It must be old. There aren't many pale people around now. This must be from colonial days when... uh, What was the name of that tribe? The British? Yes, when the British ruled Zimbabwe. This is exciting. It must be worth a lot. And look, here's a plastic duck. Rita gave the plastic duck to Kuda, who ran it around the ground, quacking. Here's part of an old quilt. Tendai tried to work it loose, but dampness and rot made it crumble. He chipped out a clump of earth with a bright square of cloth still attached and took it to the light. It was beautifully done. Someone had spent hours fitting together jewel-like bits of material with tiny stitches. Any attempt to free it made the cloth disintegrate into mold no different from the earth. Once again, Tendai felt uneasy. I'm sorry, he apologized to the unknown ancestor who had patiently made the quilt. He dug a little hole in the side of the tunnel and buried the cloth there to honor his or her memory. There are lots of valuable things down here. We could become millionaires, said Rita cheerfully. She seemed to have no qualms about disturbing the ancestors. Tendai didn't say that if they found anything valuable, the she-elephant would certainly take it from them. So finding all of these valuables in this mound compares to something that we do. What does this sound like where people are finding things that maybe don't seem so valuable to some but seem valuable to others? Share what you think with your fellow listener. And now literally seconds more of the ear, the eye, and the arm. When the cart was filled with refuse, Rita and Tendai pulled it down the tunnel to the main chamber. They had to drag their chunks of cement behind them. Kuda, who wasn't chained, helped them as best he could. They found a new empty cart each time they visited the chamber and rolled it slowly back. We will mine more adventures as the ear, the eye, and the arm continues.